Welcome back to Coding Shorts. My name is Sean Wildermuth. Today I want to talk about minimal APIs yet again, but this time I want to talk about how to use fluent validation with it. Now, if you come from MVC, you might be used to model validation and know that it isn't really a thing in minimal API. They certainly might make it in the future, but right now I'm going to show you how to do it with fluent validation instead. Did want to mention if you could like and subscribe, it really helps the channel grow. We've been steadily heading towards 10,000 subscribers, but I know some of you still aren't subscribed, so please do it. It does help. Let's take a look at minimal API and fluent validation. Let's get started. So I'm here inside Visual Studio Code, and I've got a really, really simple, some might say even stupid API setup. I have an API for people, API for people to get an individual object, and then a way to create a person. Though note, I'm not actually doing any saving. I'm just returning created, just so we can see what's actually happening here. And so if we were to run this, and I'm going to use Thunder Client again to show you how to do something like this get, right? I go call some data. It's going to return me an object that has some information in it. And if I try to do it with just people, unsurprisingly, it works. And if I try to do a post, you'll see I have some content here that looks like a person. It'll just return me the right thing. Now, notice that phone is empty, and that might not be what we need. We might want to run some validation before we post it into the database or data store, whatever you're using. So how are we going to do that? Let's stop the app running. I'm just going to open the terminal and say .NET add package, and then fluent validation ASP.NET Core. This includes some extensions for registering validators, but let's not worry about that quite yet. Once we have that added, we're going to want to do something in here to handle validation. So we might want to say if validation dot is valid, right? That's really what we're looking at. Then we should do something with it. Otherwise, return results.problem, right? That's effectively what we want to do. Don't worry about the lack of errors here because we don't really have any validator set up in the system yet. So let's go ahead and let's create a new directory called validators. And I'm just going to use this to create a new validator for people. So I'll call this my people validator. And all I'm going to do is make a public class that derives from abstract validator. And this is going to have the type of people in here. So we're going to need to fix the namespaces like adding fluent validation and also adding our data. And in fact, I'll change this since I mistyped it to person. So we're going to create a public constructor called person validator. We don't need anything passed in, though you're welcome to do it if you want logging or anything. And I'm just going to create rules. If you haven't used fluent validation at all, this validator is going to set up rules that are going to be tested against. So probably the most common way to do this is rule four. And this is where we're going to hand it a function to find what property we're looking at. So let's start with full name here. And what do we want full name to be? We want it to have a maximum length, let's say of 255, and not empty, right? Two very simple rules. We can do that again for our other properties, email dot email address. And this is a specific rule that they have built in that allows us to make sure that it's a valid email address. It uses some way to do that. And then we'll have a rule for our last piece, which is phone. Now here I'm gonna say not empty, just so we can have a starting point. And one of the things you can do here is say with message, and I'm gonna say must be a valid phone number. Right, We're not testing that validation yet, but that's clearly where we want to be headed. So now that we have the validator, how are we going to actually use it here? Well, first, we're going to need to register validation. So if I come here and say builder.services, I can add validation in a number of ways. So let's go ahead and say using fluent validation. And I think that'll get us these add validation. Add validators from assemblies, from assembly, from assembly containing or assembly containing multiple. So I'm going to actually say, go ahead and find an assembly that has the type of person validator. Now, this isn't saying register just this validator. This is saying register all validations in the assembly that contains this type. 
You can, in fact, call multiples. But this way, as you add validations, these are going to be automatically added to the service collection. Now that we have it, we should be able to come down here and say, I validator person validator, right? Because it's in the service collection, we can inject it here. And then we can simply say validation equals validator dot validate, and we can hand it in our person. Now, I usually suggest that people actually use the async validate because you may not know as this code goes over time whether there's going to be any asynchronous validation used at all. So let's come back over here and say async so that that will all work. And now we have this, right? In fact, the validation object that comes back, if it's not valid, if we change this to validation problem, we can actually just pass in the rules that were off by saying to dictionary. And this will return back what's wrong with validation to the user. So we have it all working here. Let's run it. We go back to this post. Let's try to send it. And immediately it's going to say must have a valid phone number. This came from checking whether, let's look at that validator for a minute, checking whether that it was not empty. So a phone number is required. And instead of just calling not empty with messages, I'm going to throw one in here that says it's not empty and that will fail first. And then we can say must and must or must async allows you to just put in a rule that you're somewhat handcrafting. And so in this case, I'm going to be passed in the phone number, right? Let's call this phone just so you can really see what's happening. This must is being passed in whatever I decided in the rule. And I can just say regex regex. Let's go ahead and bring in that expression is match. And I'm going to say phone and then give it a regular expression that we're going to use. And we'll see that it's complaining because it could be null. Let's go over here and put an explanation point. Just so we're saying we know it's not going to be empty. It could be an empty string, but it's not going to be null. And with this change, let's restart our app. We go back to this and we send it. We're going to see phone can't be empty and must be a valid phone number. Well, this is very interesting, right? We're getting two messages here and we're getting two because this with message is only being attached to this must. If I wanted it to be different here, I could put with message after it. And so it's a fluent syntax for setting up these rules. And we went ahead and gave it a phone number like 404-555, but typed it in wrong. Then we'll see it must be a valid phone number. And then... 1515. Let's see if that's a valid phone number. And yes, it is, because now we're only getting the email. Let's go ahead and give it a valid email and send it again. And we can see that it actually created it, right? And so we have this validation built in. But one of the things I don't really care for is how this all works. I want this minimal API just to be doing the work it really needs to do, which is just this part. I'd like to generalize this or separate it in one way. And in .NET 7, we can do that with endpoint filters. So if we say add endpoint filter, and we, I'm just going to use a Lambda right now, and it takes context and next. So this is the context of the call, and next is to call the next in the chain. I'm going to move this validation in here, right? So I'm going to remove all this, and I'm going to remove all this to just leave the code that we really care about. And we're going to need to do a couple of things because we don't know who the person is and we don't know what the validator is because we can't really inject it in here for us. And so let's get rid of that validator context, HTTP context, request services, and I'm going to get required service. Or in fact, I'm going to get service and just tell it that I want a I validator for a person. Needed one more little thingy there. And so once we have that, we should be able to do the same thing. See validators here. But the problem is that this is being returned as possibly found it. So we might want to check for validation. But in here, I'm actually just going to say if a validator is not null, that IntelliSense is making me crazy, then I'm not going to do anything, right? So. We also need to make this a sync since we're using an await there. No big issue there, but we still need to get the person. And where does the person come from? I'm going to say person equals context.arguments. And because I know this is the first person, I can just say zero as a person. So I can test both of these. And person is not null, right? 
We got all that. And so what do we do in these cases, right? Um, if the validation is valid, then we just return await next and passing back in that context. Otherwise, we'll return a validation problem if the validation failed. Otherwise, we'll say, you know what? If there isn't a validator and a person isn't there, we're going to assume that we don't have one of those two pieces. And so I'll also just return await next context. I could probably pretty this up a little, but you get the sort of idea here. And so by doing this, one of the things to note is that when we find a validation problem, we're returning it instead of continuing down the pipe. So this will interrupt the call to map post because this is actually going to be executed before our map post. Make sense? And so let's go ahead and run this again. Make this invalid again, just so we can see it working. We see we're getting that same validation problem. And this is great, sort of. Like writing an endpoint filter for every one of these is kind of annoying. So instead of that, let's go ahead and create a new file. I'm going to call validation filter, right? This will be a public class. And what is it going to do? It's going to implement the I endpoint filter interface, which I'll go ahead and implement the interface. And you can see here that this is going to be invoked when this is added as a filter. And I'm going to make sure that's async because you can see it returns a value task. And so we need to actually uh, do that because what is going to go in here is that same code we had before, but I'm going to make it a little better by using a generic argument. Now, why is this going to make it better? Because over here, let's borrow all this code. We need to make this a little different, but we should get pretty close. I'm just going to name that context. So I have to name it every place and bring in this namespace. And so we're going to go over the same problem of getting the validator. And if the validator is not null, then we can go ahead and continue, right? I'm going to separate those from actually finding the entity, I'll call it. Instead of knowing what it is, we're going to actually use some link here to help us. So we're going to say of type T, we're going to assume that you're going to try to give me T's here. And then I'm just going to try to find the first or default what? Get type equals type of T, right? And so if this entity is not null, we can go ahead and do our validation. And all of this is pretty much the same. And if it's not null and it passes, we're going to go ahead and call the next validation. Only in the case where we couldn't find a validator, we're also going to return this. So let's add an else here, or we return results.problem could not find type to validate. Because remember, this is going to be any of the parameters in the method call, right? Because this could be first, could be third, fifth, whatever it is. We're only going to test it against the type of validation filter we want. And I do need to make sure that this validator is just getting us a validator for whatever class we're specifying. So this becomes pretty general use. So that what can we do here? We can actually just say endpoint filter validation filter. Now, what are we going to use here? Person, right? This way, anytime you're making a change, you can specify one or more. Now, what if you were bringing in multiple types here, right? You can actually use multiple endpoint filters to try for the different types because these are just called in series. And so it becomes much easier as you're building your minimal APIs to go ahead and make these sorts of changes. Now, notice that I want to add this on every call automatically, like creating a filter at the top level, because I don't want to be burdened with it for gets or probably deletes. But for updates and for puts and posts, I really do want to use this because I want to make sure it's the right data after all. Here we can get rid of async because we're not using it just to get rid of that little bit of mess. Let's rebuild it and make sure everything works still. Let's come back to here. Let's try to send it and we can see it's still working even though our program is just using this filter. So if we were to make a change to the validator so that this has the single responsibility to know whether a person is valid or not, let's create a new rule greater than zero, right? By making this change, 
None of this other code, the actual APIs you're creating, need to worry about that. Just where you need to validate that filter, you now have a single point for doing this. And the rules are really varied. There's a lot of built-in rules like greater than and must, but you can also build your own rules that maybe you want to apply to different places. The Fluent Validation System is really effective. And I prefer this to attributes in general because I don't want that person class to be anything other than a dumb structure right? This could even be a record in that case. I don't want to have this all be responsible for both what the validation is as well as what the structure of that data is. Now, remember, if you're using something like DTOs or models for passing your data in or out, you may have different validators for the person as well as the person model, right? So you might have different needs for both of those. So it could become really useful to build these validators. So that's just a little piece. There is likely a NuGet package out there that already does all this for you. But the purpose of showing you this is to give you a hint about fluent validation, which I love, but also to sort of talk about .NET 7's endpoint filters and how they can be used and how you want to sort of take them away from one-offs, unless you really do need a one-off sort of test so that you are adhering to as much as possible single responsibility. That API probably shouldn't be responsible for validation. So we can move that into something that is almost an aspect that is plugged in to do that one piece of work. And you can imagine using these for all sorts of things. If you've gotten this far, I really appreciate you watching the video and liking it and certainly clicking on that subscribe button would really, really help me. If you're interested in any of the things I do, you can always go to Pluralsight and watch my courses, as well as visit my sean.wildermuth.com site to see what other things I do. Thanks for joining me. See you next time on Coding Shorts. Mm -hmm.